would you state your full name for the record, please? Paul Ruben Flores. And what is your date of birth, sir? 10 76 Uh, your social security number? 5469. What is your president, uh, present residence address? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. This is Paul Flores, a predator who, in 1996, violated and murdered a popular girl after attending a party on campus. But while everyone suspected what he had done, no one could prove it for 26 years until a podcast changed everything. So what really happened that night, and why did the case take so long to be solved? Let's look into the case of the teen who went to a party and vanished for 26 years before finally being found. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February 20th, 1977 in Bavaria, West Germany. She was the first of the three children of Denise and Stan Smart and was described as warm, kind, fun-loving, and adventurous. She loved swimming, skiing, and traveling, and always ended her emails with, live your life to be an exclamation rather than an explanation. She definitely like took advantage of life, seized the day. She was super ambitious and was determined, you know, to find the next adventure, to find the next challenge. By the time she went to college, Kristen had traveled to various places by herself, including London, Venezuela, and Hawaii. She was actually a lifeguard and a camp counselor at a Camp Hawaii in the summer before she disappeared. In 1996, Kristen enrolled at California Polytechnic State University, or Cal Poly as it's popularly known. But like many freshmen, she was having a hard time adjusting. She would even call her parents, begging them to let her drop out and go somewhere else. But her parents encouraged her to stick it out and that things would get better. And they did, but only for a short while. On Friday, May 25th, 1996, the start of Memorial Day weekend, Kristen was super excited about attending an off-campus frat party with her friends. But before leaving, she reportedly called her mom and left a very excited message on the answering machine, saying she had some good news and would phone again on Sunday. But she never did. That evening at around 8.30 p.m., Kristen left the campus grounds with three of her girlfriends heading to a party. But Later, the friends changed their minds and decided to go back home, leaving Kristen to attend the party alone. I was like, Kristen, I'm gonna go back home. I'm gonna go back to the dorms. You can go. And she's like, please come with me. Please come with me. I told her I didn't, I didn't wanna go. One of the friends, Margarita Campos, said in an interview with CBS News 48 Hours that when they parted ways that night, Kristen didn't have any money, ID, or her keys on her. So Margarita gave Kristen her keys so she could let herself back into the residence hall later. She was absolutely sober when I left her. I'll never forget her shadow against the building, this apartment complex, just standing like kind of cross-armed with a long leg. And she was just kind of like looking at me like, you're really walking away now. Like, you're really, you're leaving. Before leaving, Margarita said that she asked Kristen to be careful, and Kristen responded, I'll be fine. But she wasn't, and that's a thought that haunts Margarita to this day. To this day, like, I was like, why? Why did I just let her go by herself? I did have guilt about that, but uh, you have to understand, she's a really independent, free spirit. The next morning, Margarita and some other friends went to Kristen's dorm to check on her, but to their surprise, she was not there. I was expecting her to knock on my door and be like, oh, Margarita, you missed a rager, and here's your key. I knocked on her door and I thought she was just sleeping or she went out and about, you know? It wasn't until Kristen's roommate returned from her vacation on Monday, May 27th, that they learned that Kristen never came home. All of her belongings, including her purse, credit cards, money, and ID, were still in the room exactly as she had left them on Friday. Something was definitely wrong. When the university police were notified about Kristen's disappearance, they apparently didn't take it seriously and thought that she was out having fun somewhere. The campus police, they were like, are you sure she didn't go out of town? It's like, she has nothing on her. How could she have gone out of town? But Kristen's roommate and friends persisted, calling both the campus police and the San Luis Obispo Police Department until the campus police finally opened a file for her. They conducted several interviews talking to everyone who was at the party with Kristen that night, and then wrote this totally outrageous report that Kristen's family said sounded more like victim blaming. They concluded by saying these observations are in no way implying that her behavior caused her disappearance, 
but they provide a picture of her conduct on the night of her disappearance. Apparently, many of the students at the party reported seeing Kristen, who had introduced herself as Roxy, acting kind of weird like she was high on something. One student said that she was drinking tequila, while another said she was chugging tumblers of vodka. Still, there were some who could not recall seeing her with any drink, making Kristen's parents believe that someone at the party could have roofied her, which was a growing trend at the time among university students. At some point during the night, Kristen was apparently seen talking to Paul Flores, another 19-year-old freshman. Then at around 2 a.m., two students, Cheryl Anderson and Tim Davis, found Kristen passed out on a neighbor's lawn. She could not stand on her own, and so the two decided to help walk her back to her dormitory, which was about 10 minutes away. But before they started out, Paul reportedly appeared out of nowhere and decided to join them. He placed his arm around Kristen's waist and put her arm around his neck and helped her walk. When they got back to the campus, Tim went in a different direction, towards his dorm, with Cheryl assuring him that they would make it the rest of the way on their own. But later, Cheryl would testify in a deposition that Kristen would occasionally stop and Paul would tell Cheryl to just go ahead if you want. Cheryl thought this was a little weird and waited for them to catch up. But when they got back to her building, Cheryl said that Paul insisted that he would take her home. They had a little back and forth and Paul promised to see Kristen to her dorm safely. Before leaving, Cheryl said that Paul asked her for a goodnight kiss, which she thought was weird and refused. He then asked her for a hug and she declined and went to her dorm, leaving Kristen alone with him a decision she would regret for the rest of her life. Paul told campus police that when he and Kristen reached their respective residence hall, they went their separate ways. But during the interview, investigators noticed that he had a black eye and asked him about it. He claimed that he got hurt playing pickup basketball the Monday after the party. However, another player would tell the cops that Paul had the black eye even before the game. And when they asked him about it, he claimed that he just woke up with it and had no idea how he got it. So... Why had he lied to the police? The search for Kristen went on for weeks with volunteers, campus police, and local authorities scouring the area for her. They used horses and ground penetrating radar devices and even conducted a dig at the landfill where the university's trash was dumped, searching for her body, but they didn't find anything. Meanwhile, Kristen's parents were increasingly growing desperate and frustrated by the way the campus police were handling their daughter's disappearance. After trying to get the FBI involved, they took the matter into their own hands and went searching for their daughter. While Kristen's mom stayed home in Stockholm, waiting for the news of her husband, Stan was going all over and pursuing every lead that he thought would bring this little girl home. When the two women claiming to be psychic told him that his daughter could be found at a specific spot in the hills behind the campus, he climbed there on a 100 degree day and spent hours searching, but nothing. Then a self-proclaimed dowser or water witch told Stan that he had identified his daughter's whereabouts by dangling a weight on a string over a map and that she was alive and living at Lake Tahoe. And Stan jumped in his car and drove north, but again came back empty. The map was consulted again, and Stan was sent to some remote stretch of the Nevada highway, but nothing. He was then sent to a public hospital in San Luis Obispo, where he was told Kristen had checked herself in, but again, nothing. By the end of all these, the family was left crushed and heartbroken, yet they did not give up. At some point in the case, the DA was brought in to help, and their main suspect was Paul Flores. Now, Paul was a below average student who, according to his parents, had trouble making friends. While in high school, his parents even bought him a pool table, hoping it would attract other students to their home. At Cal Poly, Paul was known as a creep who would go around groping girls and hitting on them even in front of their boyfriends. Some girls around the campus had even nicknamed him Chester the Molester. According to a source, Paul would sit in his room drinking beer on weekend nights, and then when he was drunk, he'd go wander around the outskirts of campus looking for parties. On the night Kristen went missing, a student said that he heard a loud noise in the hallway, and when he went to check, he found Paul on top of Kristen Smart. It was not clear whether Paul had knocked Kristen down on purpose or if it was an accident, but the two reportedly just got up and went on their separate ways. The DA officers spent about a week revisiting Paul's initial account of that night while chipping away at his alibi. In his initial interview with the campus police, Paul said that he watched Kristen walk the path toward her dorm before he entered his hall. However, his roommate, who had been away for the weekend, said that Paul told him, 
that he walked Kristen home and then came back to his room. But later, when the roommate started teasing him about the case, asking him what he really did with Kristen, Paul reportedly told him, she's home with my parents. This joke, as the police later characterized it, would not be so funny to Kristen's family and supporters who had received numerous tips about a patch of concrete being poured in the backyard of an Arroyo Grande home owned by Paul's parents after Kristen disappeared. On top of that, someone reportedly found an earring that matched a necklace that Kristen was known to have in Paul's parents' driveway. It was like a red thing and it was like a smudge, like fingerprint look on the back, just red like maroon, like old looking, and a smudge that it was like a half a fingerprint. Coincidence? I think not. Yet for some reason, the police didn't mark the earring as evidence, and it got lost somewhere in the station. At the beginning of the investigation, Paul had agreed to a polygraph test, but then he kept putting it off until finally the district attorney's investigators picked him up and told him it was time for the test. One detective would later say that Paul just turned white in fear. He was taken to a conference room at the Arroyo Grande police station and questioned for about 90 minutes. The investigators started by bluffing that they knew he had taken a shower that night instead of going straight to bed, as he first claimed. He admitted that yes, he had gone into a communal shower at about 5 a.m. after becoming sick. He also admitted to lying about the black eye, saying that he didn't want to sound stupid. In truth, he claimed he had whacked himself while working on a truck parked at his father's house. Now, what's striking about this interview according to the people who have seen the videotape, was Paul's body language. When investigators pressed him, pointing out that Kristen was last seen with him, Paul pulled his arms into his t-shirts, scrunched over at the waist in his chair, and lifted his feet off the floor, as if moving toward a fetal position. At that point, it seemed that he was about to crack and confess everything. But he didn't. Instead, he actually looked at the detectives and dared them, saying, if you're so smart, then tell me where the body is. And since the detectives were only working on theory and didn't really have a body, they didn't answer. So Paul just stood up and headed for the door. Shortly after, his mother got him a lawyer. Anything to say? This time, the smarts are still pointing the finger at you. If you have anything that you want to say that you think the public should understand about your position and why you haven't spoken out. Now, during the early stages of the investigation, there were some pretty interesting developments that convinced detectives that Paul was their guy. Apparently, a team of cadaver dogs, which has been trained to react wherever a dead body has been, were brought to Santa Lucia Hall and taken one by one through all the dormitories. And intriguingly, all three dogs were drawn to one particular door that happened to have been Paul's room. They started barking and scratching to be allowed in. One of the handlers later said that her dog was just about to break her neck to try to get into that room. And once inside, each of the dogs made their way to a corner of what had been Paul's bed. Investigators were really impressed by this, but said dogs can't testify in court. And when handlers do, their testimony can be countered by opposing experts who poke away at the scientific uncertainties about why cadaver dogs react as they do. But there was still some other things that pointed to Paul being the culprit. Five months before Kristen disappeared, the police were called by a student reporting that there was a man on her balcony. There was a man climbing her trellis and trying to get inside her balcony, very intoxicated and refusing to leave. When they showed up, it was Paul Flores. At the time, no charges were filed. In October 1996, Paul was among the eight people subpoenaed to give evidence before a grand jury, but suspiciously he invoked his Fifth Amendment right to not incriminate himself. His testimony lasted only about five minutes, and then he was let go. Uh, would you state your full name for the record, please? Paul Ruben Flores. And what is your date of birth, sir? 10 76 uh, Your social security number? 5469 what is your president, uh, present residence address? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. After a year had gone by without any progress in the case, the sheriff at the time made a rather shocking admission. We need Paul Flores to tell us what happened to Kristen Smart. The fact of the matter is we have very qualified detectives who have conducted well over a hundred interviews and everything leads to Mr. Flores. There are no other suspects. So absent something from Mr. Flores, 
I don't see us completing this case. And for many years, nothing much happened in the case. And in 2002, Kristen was declared legally dead, much to the frustration of her family. They contacted a lawyer and filed a wrongful death lawsuit. It was just a sad phone call to have somebody say, our daughter disappeared and we think she's the victim of foul play and we'd like to pursue the guy that we think is responsible. The lawyer felt bad for the family and decided to work pro bono, promising to go after Paul Flores and put pressure on the sheriff's office. And it says wrongful death, and then I put murder. Putting murder on the lawsuit was sending a message to Paul Flores and his family that we believe that he killed Kristen and that we're coming for him. But things would not be so easy. It was no secret that Kristen had been murdered and that her killer was Paul Flores. Yet for many years, Paul remained free and went on with his life like it was nothing. Hi, Paul. Good morning, I'm Jonathan Vigliotti with CBS News. Were you involved in the disappearance of Kristen Smart? Paul, can you tell us what happened that night between you and Kristen? But that would change in a very dramatic way. Father and son, both behind bars, arrested in connection with the disappearance of Kristen Smart. She was a 19-year-old student at Cal Poly when she vanished almost 25 years ago. Authorities say that even though her body has never been found, they're treating this as a murder investigation. It took a quarter century to get to this moment. 44-year-old Paul Flores was arrested Tuesday on suspicion of murdering 19-year-old Cal Poly classmate Kristen Smart back in 1996. His 80-year-old father, Ruben, booked as an accessory for allegedly helping his son cover up the killing. It all started in 2019 when musician Chris Lambert, who had grown up watching the case, decided to start a podcast called Your Own Backyard, hoping to find out what happened to Kristen. It's a cold and cloudy winter afternoon in San Luis Obispo, and I'm retracing missing Cal Poly student Kristen Smart's last known steps. Although he had never investigated before, he actually quit his job to focus on the podcast and began by collecting articles and documents about the case, chasing down leads and interviewing people who police might have overlooked. I didn't know the scale. I didn't know how many people were going to listen, but I knew that I could try to do a small part. At the time, he had no idea that his part would go a long way in helping to bring the case to a close. His podcast ended up capturing the attention of millions of listeners and sparked a new interest in Kristen's case. Several women even started coming out and sharing some pretty terrifying experiences they had with Paul. So I walk him up to his sister's apartment, and all of a sudden he just like picked me up, carried me inside, turned around, he up the apartment door and locked it. So I said, you better turn some lights on right now and let me out or I'm going to scream. So eventually he unlocked you know, the apartment door and, and I left. And he had like a butter knife and he like held it to my neck and I was screaming and my roommate actually kicked down the door to make him stop. Strangely enough, Paul was never charged for any of these incidents. On January 29th, 2020, the San Luis Obispo Police Department announced that two trucks owned by the Flores family had been taken in as evidence. The following month, search warrants were served for specific items of evidence at four different locations, including the homes of Paul's mom and dad, who had been separated at the time Kristen disappeared. Authorities served a search warrant at the San Pedro home of Paul Flores early this morning. It's the second time this year. Investigators say he continues to be a person of interest in the 1996 disappearance of Cal Poly San Luis Obispo student Kristen Smart. The San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office said with the help of the L.A. County Sheriff's Department, they went to look for specific items of evidence, but they couldn't release any details because the warrant is sealed by the court. Later, it was revealed that there was some physical evidence found in the two homes, showing that Kristen's body had once been buried there. Forensic physical evidence was located, and yes, we believe it's it's linked to Kristen. Um, and yes, we did find physical evidence at at least two homes. On top of this, there were reports that three people, including Paul's mom and dad, had been up all night working below the deck of the Rubens home before the police came to search it. So why would Susan Flores, her boyfriend, and, and Ruben Flores be up all night long working 
under that deck. Police also found disturbing evidence showing that Paul's predatory behavior did not stop after Kristen's disappearance. There were a bunch of roofies found at his home, as well as some pretty disturbing videos showing Paul violating a number of young women in various states of unconsciousness. Over the years, Paul's parents, Susan and Ruben, have denied playing any role in Kristen's disappearance and insisted that their son was innocent. I don't have any reason to believe that anybody in our family has any answers to where she is or what happened to her in the final. What has that question been like to Paul? How have you had to ask him or, you, or is it something? And that's something, no, we're not, we're not going to discuss. Does your son have any information as to where Kristen Smart's body is located? Nope. Has your son ever told you that he did not kill Kristen Smart? We never asked that question. We well, just, the only thing about it, he says no. Through the years, the Smarts have kept pressure on the Flores family, but the Floreses have fought back, suing the Smarts for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The news today of arrest in connection with the case brings sadness, but also a measure of relief and hope for resolution. Paul's trial began in June 2022, with the prosecution talking about Paul's history with women and how he was a predator who had violated several women. He said that on the night of May 25, 1996, Paul tried to violate Kristen in his dorm room, and in the course of events, he killed her and then buried her in his father's yard. Paul's defense argued that there was no case since Kristen's body had not been found, saying that whatever happened to Smart was obviously a tragic situation in one case or another. It is believed that she is deceased. There is no evidence of what happened to her after Paul Flores left her at her dorm. However, another woman named Jennifer Hudson testified in court that Paul had confessed to murdering Kristen and burying her body under a skating ramp at his place in Huasna. According to Jennifer, the confession happened a few weeks after Kristen's disappearance, and Jennifer, who was 17 at the time, met Paul at a party. She claimed that a report came on the radio asking anyone with information about Kristen's disappearance to come forward, and Paul reportedly said, and I quote, that bitch was a tease, and I got sick of her sh Jennifer said she waited for Paul to imply that he was joking, but he never did. When asked why she never reported it to the police, Jennifer said that she was afraid that she would end up like Kristen. She said she never realized how much pain she might have caused Kristen's family until after the birth of her son. On October 18th, 2022, a jury found Paul guilty of first-degree murder. He faces 25 to life in prison. As for his father, he was acquitted of his charges and set free. Without Kristen, there is no joy or happiness in this verdict. After 26 years with today's split verdicts, we learned that our quest for justice for Kristen will continue. This has been an agonizingly long journey with more downs than ups, but we are grateful and appreciate the diligence and energy of the two juries to thoroughly review the facts and reach their decisions. What do you think about this case? Do you think Paul's parents helped him cover up the crime all these years? What could have happened to Kristen's remains? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section, and if you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe.